Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to June 18th, 2020 session of the SECMIS Virtual Journal Club. My name is Mila Kostic and I will be your um, host and facilitator. Today, um, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, briefly the topic, welcome all of you, and uh, introduce our panelists today. And so allow me to just say that uh, it has been a pleasure to host this journal club. And as uh, those of you who are members of SACME know, it is one of the free uh, member benefits. And so we do this webinar uh, monthly usually, sometimes more frequently, sometimes less. And we discuss uh, topics of interest to our uh, community that are related to scholarship. And in a way that we turn to literature to inform our practice and then discuss practical applications and experiences we all have. So this is a networking opportunity. It is certainly a learning opportunity and uh, an opportunity to touch base and exchange ideas and thoughts and practices um, and research with each other. Um, I'm delighted to be able to welcome a much larger community to this series uh, in the past few months and to uh, see that um, you have embraced this program greatly. So thank you all and welcome all. I hope some of you at least will be able to join SACME formally uh, where you can uh, get a little bit uh, deeper into the discussions with colleagues and uh, have other benefits of the program. Our topic today is again related to the needs, the current needs, and uh, many of you have expressed the need to talk about um, outcomes in program evaluation of online learning because of our reality. So over the past few months, we have uh, been going through the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, that really created a tension between the need to have additional programming in continuing professional education and, and of course, uh, the challenges of producing it. Uh, so many of us have turned to online forums, we have turned to online education, and then the question became, well, how do we do meaningful evaluation of outcomes in that environment? So um, today, helping us address this topic, I'm delighted to say that we have a terrific team of experts, researchers, both uh, and educators from the University of Toronto with us. So they will lead us in the discussion uh, with their formal presentation, and then we will be able to um, take your questions in and uh, go into the discussion. I'd like to remind you all first that this session is recorded, like all of our sessions. You will be getting a PDF of the presentation with a link to the recorded session and the key references. Um, within a week, but usually it takes less time. Uh, without, what else can I tell you? Well, two things. One is you can, uh, when the time comes to engage with, with your questions and um, in a discussion, there are two ways you can do that. On your dashboard, you will see a hand icon. So if you raise that, I'll be able to unmute your microphone and call on you to pose uh, your commentary. Uh, the other way to do it is to put your question in the, type it in into the question section of your dashboard, and then we will uh, be able to read that out loud and address it that way. So <clears throat> without further ado, let me then quickly introduce our presenters. We have Dr. Walter Tavers, who is the scientist and the assistant professor at the Wilson Center and post-MD education. He is at the Postgraduate Medical Education and CPD, so Continuing Professional Development at the Faculty of Medicine, the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the School of Public Health at the University of Health Network, University of Toronto. I would like to just add that Walter is also the current chair of the Scholarship Committee and um, he's also on the Board of Directors of SECME. So welcome, welcome Walter. Uh, we also have Dr. David Wilcher, who probably does not need much introduction. Uh, David is currently the Executive Director of the Education, Technology and Innovation at the University Health Network. And he's also the Assistant Professor at the Department of Psychiatry, 
the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation, and he is the Academic Director for Continuing Professional Development at the University of Toronto. In addition, he is a collaborating scientist at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, and um, uh, he is a former chair of the Scholarship Committee and is currently President-elect of SACME. Welcome, David. Uh, also joining us, we have David Rojas, who is uh, a doctor and an assistant professor at the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is the evaluation scientist at the Center of Ambulatory Care Education at the Women's College Hospital, at the Office of Assessment and Evaluation in the MD program at the University of Toronto. He's also the uh, cross-appointed scientist at the Wilson Center at the University Health Network and the, at the University of Toronto. So as you can see, as accomplished a group as we could possibly hope for. So I'm delighted to welcome you all and would like to turn it over to Walter now to take us through the presentation. Go ahead, Walter. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Mila, for the introduction and thank you all for uh, joining us today. We're certainly very excited uh, to talk about this uh, topic. It's something that we uh, are all participating in some form or fashion and, and uh, struggling through as well. And so I've had to uh, place some time and energy into how to work through this and leverage some of our experiences in other contexts and how to manage this, uh, this COVID uh, era and this movement, this rapid movement to uh, lots of different formats for delivering CPD. Um, I'll just start real quickly, just as a disclosure, both David and I um, hold some grants, uh, Manning grants that are related to uh, SACME and uh, uh, as well as some other funding agencies and are part of the uh, SACME board as uh, Mila described. So what we're hoping uh, to get through uh, in this session is uh, essentially these two objectives. The first being to listen and discuss principles of program evaluation applied to online formats of CPD and David's going to really, David Rojas is going to really take us through that particular piece. And then also to describe outcome frameworks that focus on change and can be applied to online formats of, of CPD. And, and David uh, Wilger is going to help us work through that. And my role here is to uh, set the stage a bit and maybe think through some of the principles and also contribute a little bit to the uh, to the outcome uh, framework piece. Um, so as uh, Mila mentioned, I'm a uh, education scientist uh, and so think a lot about uh, assessment in general. Uh, but as it can be applied to uh, program evaluation as well. And, um, and of course, uh, as part of my uh, role in um, post-MD, which includes CPD, it involves thinking about these things as well. Um, so the, uh, to set the stage a bit though, I think what we are hoping to get across here is not uh, a very specific how-to guide here. We're not gonna lay out step one, step two, step three. Instead, what we're trying to do is provide you with a number of concepts and perhaps principles that can then be applied uh, to whatever context and whatever program, whatever strategy you put in. And what you'll see here in just a second is that we use two examples of two diverse uh, programs that can then be, um, uh, that serve as examples of what might be out there that we'll then apply these concepts to. And that's, uh, uh, again, what we're hoping to get across today and hopefully that uh, serves your needs. Um, so if we, in terms of setting the stage, I think uh, the obvious statement here is that there's been a long history of continuing professional development research and guidelines and, and strategies as to how to optimize continuing professional development. And that book there authored, uh, authored by colleagues uh, at SACME and others have uh, really laid out a strong foundation as to how to uh, engage in continuing professional development. And that's probably familiar to many uh, people. And, and many of you are likely involved in continuing professional development and are doing it extremely well or have been doing it extremely well for quite some time. And then comes this interesting bug, COVID, that creates a big challenge for us and one of the biggest challenges that emerged as a result. Uh, there are many, of course, but one of the ones that affected us from an uh, education and CPD uh, perspective is this idea of um, the social or physical distancing. And so that really had huge impacts on uh, teaching and learning as well as assessment and how we would go about this process. Uh, and that's perhaps stating the obvious at that point, but it really shifted or really challenged us from a continuing development at a time when the continuing professional development needs were prob probably at their highest in some ways. And so people have talked about this, uh, David Price and Greg Campbell and others have, have brought this forward to our attention and said, look, you know, there's a, there's a real need here. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of new roles for clinicians, engaging in virtual care, caring for COVID patients and so on. 
that, that requires some degree of needing to reactivate or develop new knowledge and skills and competencies. And so there was a real opportunity and they called out this opportunity for CPD to have a real a strong benefit here to this response in general. And so there was an opportunity to leverage things that we already knew about uh, education theory and uh, what are known effective strategies. Um, but that there was going to be a requirement for some sort of some level of um, um, uh, creativity or modification or adaptations in order to deliver CPD in a way that was being restricted um, by this uh, this uh, pandemic. In other words, going virtually. So they talk about in this short commentary about the need to explore how best to use distance learning is one of the phrases we use, and we'll see that people use lots of different ways of talking about online learning. And to use technology to promote CPD to facilitate learning and practice improvement in ways that uh, you know we haven't had to in the past, and to reconceptualize the methods we use to uh, meet the needs of patients, healthcare delivery, and professional teams as well as the individual clinicians. And so one of the obvious things that happened was this idea, this this movement to online education. And so people have uh, talked about online education in lots of different ways. Um, um, but one of the definitions that's, that's talked about here, or one of the concepts that's used here, is this idea of learner interaction with content people via the internet of some, in some way, and that it can be directed or self-directed. But the reality is any sort of definition that we would try to propose to you would be very difficult to capture all the variability that exists in the modalities that people are using, methods people are using to enact this education online. Um, so there's too many, vari too many variations and advances for our typology to work fully, but for the context of our conversation today, we would say that that's what we're working with, this idea of learner interaction that happens over the internet again in different ways. And a further context, sorry, a further context would be uh, that we'd like to frame this whole conversation as this idea of uh, lifelong learning. And so there's a definition provided here as being continuously supported, a continuously supported process that stimulates and empowers individuals to acquire them all the knowledge, values, skills, and understanding they'll require throughout their lifetimes and to apply them with confidence, creativity, and enjoyment in all rural circumstances and environments. A massive uh, definition, but the idea here is that we're hoping to support those individuals on an ongoing basis, and in particular, um, as this uh, in response to this particular pandemic, but not um, solely in that way. So there are a ton of different ways that people can go about doing this, and this is just a very quick survey of all the different tools that are being now leveraged uh, and promoted and sold and talked about uh, as ways of enacting um, uh, online education. Uh, and so some of you probably likely have some experience with some of these or many of these and lots of these things. Online education has been around a very, very long time. Um, and so uh, we're not introducing a new concept there, uh, but we do hope to talk about how that can be evaluated despite uh, the modality that you use. And so it doesn't matter which one of these or any other that you decide to use, but the idea is how do you go about evaluating um, the effectiveness of that process? Now, one important distinction is to talk about is this idea between, and what P authors are starting to talk about is, in this particular context, there's this idea of remote emergency teaching versus online education and learning. And there are lots of different ways that people are talking about it. They're saying, you know, the, the design solutions can be things like distance, distributed, blended, online, mobile, and many, many others. But what they're trying to distinguish is that there are, um, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess necessarily, this emergency, what they're describing as emergency remote teaching. And so um, now they talk about this in a way that kind of makes it sound like it might be a bad thing. In other words, that it's not adhering to the common uh, high quality uh, evidence and practices around online education. And that online education specifically requires this large uh, or this ecosystem to be able to function appropriately, but the, that the emer emergency remote teaching takes a little bit uh, of a shortcut only because it has to, because it, and that's another context, context of it being an emergency. So some of the key features of those, those elements of an ecosystem that are necessary to support online education may not be fully featured or necessarily well planned. And that as a result leads to high probability of suboptimal implementation. And so this is where program evaluation really can have a, a, can have a say and have a, a large uh, role. So this idea of moving to emergency remote teaching is this temporary shift, of, or is this idea of temporarily shifting of instructional delivery uh, to online formats. 
And so the two examples that we're going to talk about here or use as context for our conversations is first this idea of remotely conducted, this, this short study that was put out about remotely conducted pediatric boot camp for fourth year medical students. Now, um, this study and the next one that I'm going to talk about real briefly is uh, we have to give some benefit to the um, to the learner or to the authors here in that they um, uh, this is just a short commentary. It's, a, it's a intended to be that, and so there's lots of elaboration that's not possible given the very short commentary. So the first one is this remote, as I said, remotely conducted pediatric boot camp. And so what they did here was they had a two-week, initially, originally, they had a two-week face-to-face pediatric boot camp elective that was given prior to entering pediatric residency that had to be canceled due to the COVID issue. And so they used Zoom to do lots of good things, things like didactic presentations, flipped classroom models, small group discussions, role play with debriefing, case discussions, online videos of procedural skills, and even self-reflection. Lots of great things were built into this program. And when they evaluated it, they looked at things, they looked at outcomes such as it was highly rated by students, confidence, students reported, responded positively, it was highly rated, facilitators had a positive experience, future plans for more robust evaluation, uh, and more. The second study that we'll use, and so we'll come back to these studies, but the second study that we'll talk about is this idea of an online faculty development using cognitive apprenticeship in response to COVID-19. And so what they did here was they also changed the face-to-face -face workshop that was based on creating multiple choice questions to an online format. And they used, again, lots of great concepts here. One was a cognitive apprenticeship model, where they framed the entire thing under a cognitive apprenticeship model where experts reveal their processes to structure their online program. And so they use many things as well, like video recorded lectures, uh, both synchronous and asynchronous, uh, document sharing, modeling, coaching, and scaffolding using breakout rooms and Zoom, reflection using previously designed MCQs and requirement to, um, to critique their own earlier work, feedback, uh, asked to create new multiple choice questions for further feedback, and so on. So again, a very robust program. And the outcomes that they included were things like changing, they said they could change faculty minds, can improve the outcomes of faculty development activities, and that trainees reported less interference uh, and better participation when this program was offered online. So now if you think about this in, in two camps, there, camp one might be that, look, this is a pandemic, outcomes are different, this is temporary, it's not ideal, we recognize that, and so evaluation just isn't feasible or even necessary, at least not now, and so let's just focus on getting the curriculum developed and content uh, adapted to the modality and move on, at least for now. And the other camp is saying, well, this is a pandemic, <laughs> this is the new normal, uh, the needs and implications are evaluated and the evaluation is actually elevated. It's more important now more than ever because the consequences are significant and the future is uncertain. And so uh, depending on which camp you sit on, presumably you're in camp two that you believe evaluation is important, that's why you're here. Uh, but of course there, there are two different ways to look at this. And so what we're gonna do now is really focus in on the outcomes piece and really talk about changes in awareness, knowledge, skill, behavior, et cetera, using a number of different frameworks that are potentially applicable, but also focus or try to focus in on the impact of the educational strategy that we're trying to implement. And so that would be, again, ultimately, or the ultimate intended change in an organization, community, or other system, and that outcomes are informed, uh, outcomes are intended to inform those impacts. And so what I'd like you to do, just briefly, if you can, either in the chat box or uh, on a piece of paper or, or just keep mental note of is to say what outcomes, what additional outcomes could those two projects, the pediatric boot camp and the MCQ online teaching modality, have additionally, could they have additionally included? Um, and then in thinking about that, if you can jot those down or share them with us, um, also think about what informed your choices of those outcomes and how might we optimize or think about that differently. So I'll give you a second to do that while I uh, transition over to David Rojas here, who is going to take us through some foundational pieces about program evaluation before we can focus in on the outcomes that David Bilger will then talk about. <clears throat> Sounds good. Thanks a lot, Walter. So before I start, as Mill explained, my name is David Rojas and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, but I also wanted to offer a little bit of a background of of where I come from. So I'm actually an engineer as a background that did my PhD on program evaluation in medical education. And what I've been trying to do is really try to structure the way that we approach program evaluation in education, understanding that we are working in a very complex system. Next one.
So for today, I wanted to start, I know the focus is on outcomes, but from a program evaluation perspective, to really try to understand what outcomes do we need to choose, we need to understand the, the rhetoric and the rationale behind the program. So when I start thinking about the conceptualization of program evaluation in medical education, traditionally has been very using a very binary dichotomy. Does it work? Does it not work? And that's what we want in evaluation. Now everything has changed. The things have changed. We're doing a lot more online learning. So really, it's, it's, our, it's in our best interest to start thinking about program evaluation in a more broader manner. So I always go back to the broader literature in program evaluation and try to look at really what they actually offer. And the suggestion of conceptualizing program evaluation is to do it as a systematic process of data collection analysis that can be used for judgment, but at the same time can be used for program refinement. Next slide. So where does this fit? So clearly something has changed in the things that we are analyzing, the programs that we're analyzing, the courses that we're analyzing. When I think about program evaluation approaches, there, there can be divided by many different dimensions, but today I'm gonna be talking about the purpose. And I'm gonna be talking about three specific uh, program evaluation approaches. The first one is the developmental approach. And the developmental approach is traditionally used for innovation, especially when we don't have a benchmark that we are trying to measure ourselves with. We don't know what is what we're trying to create, but we're developing something that is very innovative. The second piece is the formative evaluation. And in the evaluation perspective, formative evaluation is an evaluation from learning. So it's a program that is currently running and we are doing data collection and data analysis to make sure that that program at that point actually reaches the benchmark, the benchmark that we are interested in. And the last piece is the summative evaluation in which we take all the data that we have collected so far and actually make a value, uh, value judgment on whether the program has made its goals or not. What is very important in here is that what I wanted to highlight is that the purpose of the evaluation approaches is actually determined by the maturity of the unit of analysis, in this case being the educational activities that you guys are working with. So traditionally, when we're working in uh, in-person uh, teaching environments, uh, it's very easy and we know exactly what is the benchmark that we're trying to get, but we're transitioning to online learning. Perhaps we need to try to understand what is the level of maturity of the activity that I'm trying to uh, study and then determine which approach that we're gonna go work with. Next slide. So a, a very good quote that I have to explain this comes from a steak in 2004, and it says that when the cook tastes the soup, that is a formative evaluation. When the guest tastes the soup, that is a summative evaluation. When the host is actually planning what to do for the guest, that is developmental. And that helps us to understand this idea of the level of maturity across the unit of analysis that we have. Next slide. So to reinforce, there's clearly a close relationship between the maturity of the unit of analysis and the purpose by which we select the approach that we are doing evaluation. Next slide. Next slide. So. How about program evaluation during COVID? If we're really gonna start thinking about program evaluation, we need to think about the components of that program evaluation, such as purpose, the audience, the how do we utilize the data, and the, uh, and the participants that we're gonna be collecting the data from. Next slide. Oh, it's going backwards. Okay, next slide. So when I'm talking about purpose, as I explained previously, the level of maturity of the unit of analysis does change the purpose of why we're doing this particular evaluation. And that has a cascading effect on the audience and the way that we are utilizing the data. In reality, the main thing that is staying the same is the participants from which we are collecting the data from. Next slide. So what happened with the purpose? Does the purpose change if the level of maturity of the unit of analysis changes? Next slide. So we started with an evaluation and we had the two dimensions. One was impression teaching and one was online teaching. If we think about the outcomes that we were collecting on impression teaching, most of the outcomes were oriented at didn't meet its goals. Same for online teaching. The traditional methods of online teaching, it was all about didn't meet its goals. However, when we start looking at the traditional evaluation tools that we use in medical education, we understand that it, things are very good when the results of our evaluations are rather positive, they in agree or don't agree. But if an evaluation question is trying to ask us about how does the core has helped improve, and we start getting neutral, a disagree or don't disagree, then things start getting more complicated. Because one thing we know that we are not 
meeting the goals, but at the same time, we don't have enough information to know how to actually get there. Next. So what I'm proposing here is that at this point, when we're thinking about outcomes, we need to think beyond the traditional outcomes, not only the outcomes that are oriented at the immediate goals, but also outcomes that can help me identify does it need to be improved? And if it does need to be improved, how can I actually get there? Next slide. So what happens with audience and the utilization of the data? How does it change now that the purpose have actually changed? Next. So when we start thinking about the questions that we're asking, that is prime in program evaluation, and then we understand how those questions actually influence the purpose of my evaluation and the outcomes that are going to be looking. Uh, I have a table in here that shows the different uses or the different model that we engage when we are uh, asking different questions. So if we think about that's admitted goals, that traditionally is a process of quality assurance that we usually engage in our learning activities. And that data is usually used by accreditation uh, processes or by program leadership. However, when we start thinking about asking different questions and collecting different outcomes, such as does it need to be improved, this is start looking a lot like a process of continuous quality improvement. And what is key in here is that the audience also changes because the key for a process of quality improvement to succeed is to make sure that we are closing those cycles, that the people that we're collecting that data is receiving the feedback that we are doing something with that data. Next slide. So I wanted to situate this within some core principles of program evaluation. So as I've been mentioning, the maturity of the unit of analysis will definitely help inform the purpose and the question of the evaluation that you guys are engaging with. The evaluation purpose can definitely inform the type of outcomes that will need to be captured and analyzed as part of the evaluation. New platforms and technologies offer multiple opportunities to focus on different and new outcomes. And Walter was mentioning a couple of the platforms that are out there to engage into online learning nowadays. However, what is important is always to have a purpose of why are we collecting the data? How is the data going to be used? What is going to be informed? <clears throat> the next principle is about determining the theoretical underpinnings. And this helps when we understand how a program is working and when we understand the theory that explains how the program is working, then we know what outcomes we're going to be looking at. So regardless of everything that is changing, we know that the purpose of the evaluation is changing. We know that the audience that we will be using the evaluation is changing. We need to go back and ask ourselves, is the theory of the program changing? Is what we're trying to measure changing? And if that is changing, then we know that has an effect on all the other dimensions. But if that is not changing, then we have to ask ourselves, do we change our evaluation practices or not? And the last one, as I mentioned previously, is about always closing the loop. In all these new evaluation processes that, are gonna, that you're going to be engaging, it's very important to always show the people that you are collecting the data from what is being done with that particular data. And that will definitely influence the response rate. Next slide. So reflecting on the case studies, as Walter mentioned at the beginning, what we wanted to do is start thinking about the outcomes that the case study to use. And, and we were very thankful that we use these articles and, and really a shootout for the authors of those articles. But we wanted to engage in a process of, of inquiry and really try to think what else could I have been doing. So for the first one, the one about the online faculty development, what it was very important when I was analyzing that article is to identify what was the program theory. And in this particular case, they were using the cognitive apprenticeship model. Now, why this is important? Because by, under, by identifying the cognitive apprenticeship model, then we can identify what are the kind of outcomes that they were looking at. We know that effective, effectiveness was measured by the quality of the new questions. And I propose the questions, could there be other outcomes to measure that particular effectiveness? But at the same time, they do inform or they do mention about the process of learning asynchronously. And when we think about the cognitive apprenticeship model, that focuses on the process of teaching. So they are using that particular program theory to inform the outcomes that they are collecting. When we go into the remote uh, pediatric bootcamp, what ended up happening is that they do create equivalent experiences for their students in an online environment. However, we don't know really what are the theories that are underpinning each of those specific activities. When we think about the outcomes that they were collecting, they were saying that the sessions were highly rated, but I would invite the audience to think about what does that imply? If a session is highly rated in an online environment, what kind of information you can get out of that? No formal feedback was collected from the facilitators, and I think that is another key point in this new era that we are at. 
if we have the opportunity to engage into participatory processes that we don't only get information from one of the stakeholders but from multiple of the stakeholders, we'll be able to create a more comprehensive picture of what we're trying to understand. And the last piece is most of these evaluation works always ended up in the model was successful, the course was successful, the evidence was successful. What does that mean? Successful for whom? And under what circumstances? And I think those are gonna be the evidence that are gonna help us to reveal this new way of addressing education. Thank you. Good afternoon and, and thank you to Mila, Walter and, and David for the opportunity to be involved. Um, what I'm gonna to try to do in the next couple of minutes is just focus a little bit on how do we know what elements uh, to focus on in terms of the evaluation? Uh, and so what particular frameworks might, might we select as we move forward? So so who am I? So uh, I uh, like to think about uh, education from the perspective of the digital interaction. So I really sit in the interface of CPD uh, digital uh, tools and education um, and uh, think a lot about the patient experience as well. Um, so uh, next slide, Walter. So I'm gonna uh, quickly walk through uh, frameworks and Many of these you'll be familiar with, but what I want to think about uh, with you for a few seconds is um, how do we think about the context? So if we take a framework that most of us um, have seen before or heard about, you know, Kirkpatrick's framework, this is really looking about what did the what was the individual uh, experience? Uh, what were what were the different levels that you can go through from reaction to learning to change behavior, um, and then to what extent? you know, do those targeted uh, outcomes uh, actually come into realization? But it uh, it doesn't focus a lot on context. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, if you look at Miller, it's, uh, it's also pretty learner-centric if you think of it that way. Uh, how do we go from what, what do they, what does the learner know? How do they know it? What competence do they achieve? How do we uh, look at how that performance changes? And then what actions actually result? Next. You know, uh, from the CPD perspective, uh, uh, Moore and his colleagues really evolved this to think about, well, where are the places that we'd actually like to see those interactions happen uh, in, from, a, from a learning perspective? So starting with participation, moving up the chain past satisfaction and lear learning to really start to think about competence and performance and uh, patient health outcomes and community. and. Uh, a lot of us sort of struggle in the um, in the performance, patient health, and and community health outcomes, um, partly because it's often difficult to get that data. So so maybe as we move to the online formats, we might see opportunities uh, to do that next. Um, we also might want to think about. Uh, frameworks within a sort of the, the lifelong learning development skill and think about what does the master learner perspective look like? And uh, uh, Schumacher outlined, you know, I think a very complex framework um, for us to think about and within the context of lifelong learning. But but ag again, the, the modality of the learning doesn't play a very explicit role here. So we can think about it from, areas like self-determination theory and cognitive load theory of where and how we might experience that. Um, but the digital element has really not been layered over here very much. So thinking about how we interact with the technology. So that's an area we still need to think about. Next. The, the, uh, the, the next evolution as we start to think about the master adaptive learner, I think provides some really interesting context in the shift to digital um, as this model is really underpinned by a quality improvement lens. Um, thinking about what is the cycle of learning as we go through, you know, assessing need, um, engaging in the learning, um, thinking about the outcome, and then again, assessing what that performance looks like. That qual quality improvement cycle 
probably plays an important role as we shift to digital and and see um, fair, many elements as we saw in the case study, and I'll come back to uh, that longitudinal perspective. So this starts to uh, allow us to think a little bit in our framework about what does time do when uh, we're talking about the learning cycle and how does that allow us to adapt over time? So now we have uh, the individual, the learning cycle, now we have the ability to think a little bit about quality improvement and adapting. Um, so uh, next slide, um, thinking a little bit about what is the frame from the systems perspective. Um, and again, not all of our interventions will get here, but uh, many folks talk about the quadruple aim of thinking about as we move towards the outcomes, we can definitely think about the patient experience, the population health. Uh, cost becomes an important one here, and the shift to digital, a lot of people talk about cost, and uh, probably more importantly, the value, are people willing to pay for that digital online experience? Um, and then uh, uh, more recently, people began to talk about the care team, and we can talk, think about our learner, our, our educator team as well. Are we taking care of our education team um, as they spend more and more time in elements that they're not used to? So online environments shifting to virtual, not interacting with people. Um, are we using the skills that they were uh, that that we were trained to use in that environment, and do they have a sense of purpose? Next, the uh, Academy, Academy of Medicine and thinking about the shift to AI and advancing healthcare, I think added an important element that within the context that uh, many of us have been living in in the, in the last um, several uh, weeks of this, uh, folk, this renewed and important focus on equity, diversity, um, the issues around uh, social inclusion and exclusion, how do we start to build those elements into our, our learning? Um, and where does equity and inclusion uh, and, and bias fit within the way that we're thinking about CPD? So do we have a framework that allows us to do that? Next. And, and then we, we shift to digital and we, uh, oh, sorry, uh, one framework first. Um, just a, one more framework to think about in terms of outcomes. This is the re-aim framework. This uh, framework has really been used for knowledge translation. Um, it's nice because it has a community and I won't talk too much about it, but you can go to reaim.org. Um, and there's a, a, a model here that you can follow for the, from the knowledge translation perspective. So you can think about reach, how many people am I reaching? What's the effectiveness of my, my intervention? How is that adopted? How are people implementing that? Do we have fidelity to the model, model in terms of how that was um, intended to be deployed? And then looking at it from the perspective of, so what happens in this time perspective that we talked about earlier, um, does that start to erode? Do we maintain a certain fidelity to the model? Next. Just uh, for those who haven't looked at the REAIM framework in a while, to, uh, to say that it has evolved um, and that uh, it's been expanded to look at different elements that I think are are useful in terms of the components that uh, uh, that go into the experience um, and the issues that we need to consider. So I just leave this with you as an opportunity to go and uh, explore this a bit further. Next. Um, so, no, so now spe specifically, how do we start to think about the digital components? Um, and I think this is an area where we need to do some work in terms of starting to marry our traditional CPD of evaluation approaches with uh, technology models. This is uh, Utah too, so it is a technology acceptance model. There are many, many of these and they spring up all the time, but they have uh, similar elements around what is the on the left hand side the context in which we're we're working? What are the uh, performance expectancies of the system? Uh, what's the effort that you have to put in? What are the social influences? Are my colleagues using this, uh, and so on? Um, uh, on the lower part of the uh, of the model, you can see the the inputs from an individual perspective. What are the uh, What's my experience and how might that impact my ability to interface with a particular uh, technology? 
Um, and then at the center is what is my intention? Uh, what's my behavior? Do I intend to go online? Do I have no intention to do that? Um, do I intend to do it? But then what are my actual behaviors when I uh, shift online? And what does that, that look like? So there are many of these. I think it's important as you uh, shift to digital to start to think about um, these kinds of frameworks. Um, and then I'll just share one last one, which is sort of emerged on the digital evaluation scene. So next slide, Walter. Um, this one is uh, comes from just an outstanding evaluator from the UK, um, uh, Greenall, and um, this was published uh, in 2017. Um, and what I like about this, and I think this picks up on what David was saying earlier, is it doesn't necessarily assume success of uh, the technology that you're going to introduce. That we have to sort of think critically that just because we uh, all do our learning on on whatever platform we choose doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be successful. So this particular framework, it's the non-adoption, abandonment, scale-up, sustainability, and spread model. Very, uh, very easy to say. I, I don't suggest you go into a meeting and say, hey, let's use this framework uh, with this title. Um, people might roll their eyes a little bit. Um, but what I do suggest you do is think about the elements of this uh, framework in terms of what conditions are we working in? What technology are we proposing? What is the value um, that we can actually uh, 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 realize through using these technologies? Well, where, where are my key stakeholders? Where's my organization? Are we ready to make this shift? Uh, what does the environment look like from a wider system? And then what does this, again, what happens over time to this system? So again, just a quick flyby here, but uh, starting to think about from a digital perspective, what are the elements that we want to bake into our CPD um, uh, education and evaluation? So next. And, and so what are the, some of the principles? Well, I think you know David already called these out. Um, many of these, but uh, I want to focus on a couple of things. One is uh, this uh, opportunity of new ways of evaluating and the ability to collect new data. Um, I want to say we need to focus as much on the benefits as the challenges of the technology. And then I'll, I'll just quickly skip to the final one of thinking about uh, selecting frameworks or elements of frameworks um, that allow us to consider really important con contextual factors, things like equity, diversity, and inclusion that we may have not been thinking about enough. It does your framework uh, create the opportunity for you to really explore there? Um, and then uh, I'll quickly go to the case study. Um, I want to leave a little bit of time, uh, but just to say, um, when we think about the, the case study, uh, for me, thinking about it from the lens of the framework, you know, we need uh, to think about, in many of these cases, the longitudinal aspects, what's happening over time. What about the different modalities? And I think it, uh, these case studies illustrate uh, multiple modalities, which is uh, really nice. Um, how do we separate out the different interactions and their impact? Um, what's the impact of the social piece? Uh, one of the case studies had that coaching piece. Um, and so what happens if we put that in or take that away? And then really thinking about both the unintended consequences uh, as well as, and sometimes we don't talk about this, the intended benefits of what happened that we weren't expecting. So I'll pass over to Walter there. Great. Thank you, David and David. So just to wrap this up, I think earlier when I was um, uh, asking you to jot down or think about some outcomes, um, uh, what David uh, Wilger took us through was a whole host of uh, ideas uh, in different frameworks that could essentially um, lead us to think differently about the types of uh, outcome frameworks that we could um, use and starts to answer this question of why those particular outcomes. and when applying these kinds of frameworks, it starts to really uh, answer that question and provide opportunities for what to consider um, and how to do that. Oops, sorry. Um, so again, this is a, trying to find ways of optimizing how we think about uh, or enact uh, frameworks differently. And there's just two last ones that I'm gonna leave you with. One that um, 
uh, David Ross already alluded to, and then the one final one, and that is the role of theoretical frameworks. Um, and all we'll expose you to here, I think, is that this is definitely a way of optimizing or thinking about outcomes. And the paper that I think you can uh, use is this one by Haji that talks about this idea of uh, the role of theoretical frameworks. And again, David Ross talked a little bit about this already. And the idea is that those conceptual frameworks, much like the, all the frameworks that um, David uh, Wilder just took us through, uh, about um, uh, what outcomes to pay attention to, what things to pay attention to. And so what Haji and colleagues talk about here is they use this example of a tree and they say, look, if you look at this example here in this tree, all you know is that there's an apple next to a tree. And when we're really trying to, in the position of the apple and maybe the height of the tree and so on, and what we're really trying to understand is um, uh, how that apple landed there or why it landed there. And the only way we can come to that answer is when we think of the theoretical framework of gravity. And it's an obvious um, uh, explanation here that once we have that conceptual framework in mind, getting to that uh, understanding of how and why uh, starts to become clear. And so this, uh, this paper called Rethinking Program Evaluation in Health Professional Education Beyond Did It Work is an exceptional uh, guide, uh, or at least a conceptual guide, on how to use conceptual frameworks. And so I would encourage uh, use of that. And the last one that I'll just share with you real quick is this idea of principles. And again, as a way of how we might better optimize or think about outcome frameworks. And Tanya Horsley and Glenn Regeer and others have really talked or thought a lot about this and how we will build programs, interventions, educational models, uh, online education, and that that represents the, the intervention. And that when we get to implementing that uh, intervention, sometimes we have a, very little control over some of those things. For example, the experience of the individuals, which uh, David uh, Roa, or, uh, Roger talked a little bit about. So that little control means that at some point um, that intervention is transformed, it's transferred exactly as we uh, intended it, um, or in some ways it's abandoned or some of its core principles are abandoned. And so then there's this issue of you know, what has emerged essentially and how context uh, in terms of where these um, uh, educational interventions, online educational interventions are applied uh, really matters. And so they've extended this idea into looking at, the, again, the role of principles. And there are basically three levels uh, of principles to think about. And the first would be the techniques at the surface. So these are the contextual factors that can be tailored to local settings. So this might be the content that you include, the, uh, uh, the modalities that you use, and so on. And so you might ask, did those hold across the context, the techniques? The second would be principles in the middle. So these are the generalizable and relatively stable approaches to establishing learning conditions. Um, and again, did those principles hold? Uh, so for example, in the papers that we talked about, they offered many things like debriefing and reflection and feedback, and those are principles. And so did those principles, uh, those are activities and principles that guide those activities, hold as a result of our transition to online education? And then the last is the philosophy at the core, and that's the learning conditions that must hold for the intervention to be what its, its designers claim it's uh, intended to be. So. Again, really holding on to that philosophy and asking, as a result of the transition to um, online education, has that philosophy of education held? And these are the kinds of things that can change or be or suffer as a result of moving something that is traditionally face-to-face -face into an online format in an emergency remote teaching kind of way. And so thinking about it from the techniques, the principles, and the philosophy, and again, using this, this paper here called Learning Theory and Educational Intervention, uh, is a good way of approaching uh, this idea. And so this group has applied it to uh, problem-based learning and, and again used techniques in that paper. They talk about it from a problem-based learning perspective and talk about techniques, principles, and educational philosophy and, and look to see whether or not those things are being held across the context and the different places in which things are implemented. So it serves as a, as a nice example. Um, so I'll just say in closing that again, what we have you know, hoped to do here is provide you with access to a number of different concepts um, and conceptual frameworks to then inform the outcomes that you choose. So when we ask you to select, think about some outcomes, um, and when we looked at those two examples, uh, we were curious about the, you know, what conceptual frameworks were guiding the outcomes of those uh, authors. And again, the, 
recognizing that those were short commentaries and that there was much room, much more room to elaborate in a traditional manuscript. So we would just say here that it's more than, than working or not working, it's circumstances under which different approaches to online education meets intended purposes at different levels and why, and really trying to um, understand that piece and again making sure that it's not just simply a transition from face-to-face -to, -face to online but really uh, honing in on the ecosystem that supports online education um, and making sure that those things either in principles philosophies and answers to questions like why um, are addressed in your program evaluation. Um, so with that I'll turn it over back to uh, Mila to guide us through perhaps some thoughts and questions. Thank you, thank you Walter, thank you all for this uh, very thoughtful and I know there's a lot to cover so it's difficult and it may uh, have felt rushed at times but uh, there's really so much to think about uh, even in regular times let alone at a time of crisis that we are facing so I really appreciate it. Um, I want to say that we I had my eye on the questions and, and the commentary that was coming in from our listeners and participants and there were some really thoughtful comments so at this time i'd like to um offer an opportunity to all of you online to um maybe raise your hand uh if you'd like to provide a comment or something from your experience that you'd like to share or have a question that's specific to uh, what was presented or you know to one of our panelists or all of them so feel free to raise your hand. I will um, unmute your mic then, and uh, you can let us know what it is that you're interested in. Um, I, I understand some of you have had audio issues, and I apologize for that. It may be a function of how many of us are online, which is unusual. We have close to 200 people online, and it's terrific to have you all, but um, maybe we are breaking the, the system. Uh, hope not. So some of you asked if we, if the slides and references will be shared. Yes, of course, uh, you will have all that coming to you. Um, there are a couple of uh, interesting comments when asked what, what else can we think about when Walter asked uh, in terms of what, what could we evaluate at this time uh, that wasn't mentioned in standard and we had some uh, good comments. So for example, um, the idea of um, evaluating burnout. A uh, couple of people mentioned building a community and, and bridging sort of the education and practice that way, community of learners and of practice, which is a great idea. Um, there were a couple of things that I thought, so Sean Hackett talks about something very specific that they're starting to look at. And Sean, I'm going to go and unmute your phone line. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, let me just find you. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, talking a little bit about what you guys are doing in your place. Go ahead. Sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm an education developer with Orange, which is the Ontario Air Ambulance Critical Care Transport. Um, and we are redesigning our critical care initial education program, um, which um, follows, we just redesigned our continuing professional development. Um, but essentially in going through and identifying all of the learning objectives, um, we are going to be using a social constructivist theoretical framework and a scaffolding model in order to train learners up to um, the proficiency that we want and the performance that we want. But what we've done is we've gone through and we were looking at the um, equal rubric. Um, I think it was Taylor uh, was the author on that paper. And uh, we're looking at performances that um, include both cognitive, psychomotor, and affective objectives in order to perform. And identifying those behaviors that are unique, specific, um, or required by critical care paramedics. And then we are essentially identifying those and evaluating those um, during the initial education. And our intention then is to um, roll those over also into our continuing professional development um, uh, design. But uh, the ways that we assess our performance in the field through self-reporting, um, through um, 
uh, documentation and we look for trends in the documentation. We're looking towards identifying those performances that we identify that are EPA and being able to measure those in the field, either by um, self-identifying those, um, having other practitioners um, observe those, um, or looking for trends in the, the documentation. So in that way, we're going to be looking for our programmatic assessment to see if our education actually does translate the way we want it to into performance. Great. Thank you very much for that, Sean. I feel um, that was a plan for Walter, really. <laughs> <laughs> it was Walter's background. <laughs> no, no, really, I, I do know Sean and they, they are doing good work there. Um, I, I would say that there's, a, you know, if I reflect on what you just talked about, uh, Sean, and maybe what David uh, Wilger took us through, I think some of the things that you're doing fit nicely into uh, a couple of those frameworks that, uh, that David talked about, and I think it would be, uh, you know, probably a good strategy to uh, you know, pick up one of those or a different one. I think you mentioned one by Taylor, um, so that you know you could, you know, establish that level at which you're, you know, the outcomes that you're establishing at the moment, uh, and then to see what you would have to do differently to take it to uh, you know another level or another feature of the conceptual framework or the outcome framework that's guiding your work. Um, and that's uh, lots of people have great ideas about outcomes, and they often fit into these frameworks. And then, what these frameworks can offer is a way of uh, tailoring or tweaking or improving the next step of your evaluation strategy. Yeah, and I would just add, I think what you demonstrated in talking through your process is not being married to any particular framework. Really thinking about what what's the context, what you know, what are you trying to achieve, and what tools do you have to bring to bear, and th and then coming back to some of these other tools or really serve as a as a bit of a safety net to say, did we have we got everything we want uh, in our evaluation, and are there other things we need to consider? So this very much can be a mix and match game. I think that's okay. Some are some are very strictly applied in terms of their tools, but most of these are intended to be frameworks of ways of thinking about problems. And the more, the more we can think about a problem from different perspectives, the better. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So um, we have Catherine Furr, uh, who, who did have some issues with uh, audio saying that First of all, thanking for this information and interesting topic on evaluation. She's saying that her interest lies in equity, diversity, and inclusion. And it is already makes a statement that it's already challenging to design programs that are culturally inclusive in face-to-face -face kind of programming. And now doing it uh, more online learning, uh, it becomes even more critical um, as to how to include the cultural context in evaluation to inform future online learning. Uh, David Rojas, you mentioned uh, that it's, uh, it's important to think uh, who it's who stuff is coming from and what does what does that really mean? Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, uh, again, about the context. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I do think that uh, <clears throat> when we're thinking about equity, diversity, and inclusion, and we were thinking about how to introduce that on, on our evaluations, I do believe that we need to go back to the main principles that we really want from equity, diversity, and inclusion to be to be actually implemented. Uh, there's many different ways that people take equity, diversity, and inclusion where they want to put it in an evaluation. Sometimes it just goes around the type of participants that they are working with. Sometimes they just talk about the way that the data is actually being interpreted. So I, I would really suggest, like, if we're really interested on, on elevating our evaluation practices to include an equity, diversity, and inclusion, to also rely on the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion that we are interested in seeing. So it doesn't it, it doesn't become a tokenism. It doesn't become a oh, I'm, I'm using uh, enough participants, therefore I, I'm being <clears throat> following principles of EDI, but really just going to what are the principles of EDI that I'm interested on and really trying to address those. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, another comment that I thought was uh, interesting. So David Price said, of course, thanking for a terrific presentation to all three of you. Um, and he said that your perspectives remind, reminded him of 
uh, the helpful role that the logic model can play in connecting frameworks to various types of uh, both formative and summative uh, assessments and outcomes. So I've invited David to say a little bit more about it. David, go ahead. You are unmuted. Hi everybody, and, and David, David, and Walter. Again, congratulations. This was this was terrific. Um, it reminds me of how difficult it is to keep up with all of the different uh, frameworks that are out there. There were a couple that were new to me, so I appreciate that, and I'm going to be looking them up, and I look forward to the slides. Um, it remi it reminds me also that the older I get, um, the harder I have uh, time I have keeping track of things. And uh, the visual, you know, visual logic models or documents or tables on one page for me has been a very interesting way to connect the uh, framework or frameworks that I've chosen or pieces of them to the outcomes uh, that we're that I'm trying to look at, whether they be formative, summative, or developmental, as as uh, David Rojas mentioned. Um, Elaine Van Mel um, and Eric Humbo and others uh, published a paper, I think it was 2016 or so, um, about the use of logic models in, uh, in medical education. And it, for me, it's, it's, it's been a terrific resource that I go back to time and time again. So just, just a comment that I find those uh, particularly useful in trying to connect uh, the theory and the outcomes, and I, I hope others uh, might as well. Again, guys, great work. Thank, Thank you. you. You might see Walter and I smiling because when we did the larger version of this, the pre-COVID version, uh, about half of it was focused on logic models. So, so David, we couldn't agree more and, and thank you for your, your comments. Exactly. Thank you. I, I think, um, unfortunately, we are at the hour a little bit past it. And I know uh, many of you have other uh, um, obligations to get to. I want to thank, first of all, um, our presenters and experts. It was really uh, an honor to um, have you uh, as part of our Journal Club. So thank you very much for sharing your time, your expertise, and your thoughts. I'd like to thank all of you who were able to join us and spend an hour of your time with us. I hope you have learned something and connected with some resources and, and thoughts and ideas. Um, a reminder that we will share all the resources you heard about here so the key references the slides um, everything and the recording of the session with all of you and i'd like to invite you all to uh, join us for another session coming up in july so july 23rd we will have um, a session devoted to uh, what good looks like in with respect to online learning designing and so leading us in that discussion will be uh, another colleague from SACME, uh, Asha Maharaj, and um, uh, probably another faculty member. And I, uh, the details of that will be posted soon. So with that, I'd like to thank you all again and close this session. Farewell. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.